You are anonymous, our brave Stanford survivor, but you are a part of all of us. Your anguish touches us all. I am your mother. I am your daughter. I am your sister. I am your grandmother. I am your colleague. I am your teacher. I am your best friend. I am your girlfriend. When you are violated, we all are. All generations from all over the planet, we are one voice. Sharing your outrage and in your sorrow, our voices read your words. Your Honor, if it is all right for the majority of this statement, I would like to address the defendant directly. You do not know me, but you have been inside of me, and that is why we're here today. On January 17, 2015, it was a quiet Saturday night at home. My dad made some dinner and I sat at the table with my younger sister who was visiting for the weekend. I was working full time and I was approaching my bedtime. I would plan to stay at home by myself and watch some TV and read while she went to a party with her friends. Then I decided it was my only night with her. I had nothing better to do, so why not? There's a dumb party ten minutes from my house. I would go, dance like a fool, and embarrass my younger sister. On the way there, I joked that undergrad guys would have braces. My sister teased me for wearing a beige cardigan to a frat party, like a librarian. I called myself Big Mama because I knew I'd be the oldest one there. I made silly faces, let my guard down, and drank liquor too fast, not factoring in that my tolerance had significantly lowered since college. The next thing I remember, I was in a gurney in a hallway. I had dried blood and bandages on the backs of my hands and elbow. I thought maybe I'd fallen and was in an admin, an admin office on campus. I was very calm and wondering where my sister was. A deputy explained I had been assaulted. I still remained calm, assured he was speaking to the wrong person. I knew no one at this party. When I was finally allowed to use the restroom, I pulled down the hospital pants they had given me, went to pull down my underwear, and felt nothing. I still remember the feeling of my hands touching my skin and grabbing nothing. I looked down, and there was nothing. The thin piece of fabric, the only thing between my vagina and anything else, was missing, and everything inside me was silenced. I still don't have words for that feeling. In order to keep breathing, I thought maybe the policeman used scissors to cut them off for evidence. Then I felt pine needles scratching the back of my neck and started pulling at them out of my hair. I thought maybe the pine needles had fallen from a tree onto my head. My brain was talking my gut into not collapsing because my gut was saying, help me, help me. I shuffled from room to room with a blanket wrapped around me, pine needles trailing behind me. I left a little pile in every room I sat in. I was asked to sign papers that said, Brief victim. And I thought something has really happened. My clothes were con confiscated and I stood naked while the nurses held a rule to various abrasions on my body and photographed them. The three of us worked to comb the pine needles out of my hair. Six hands to fill one paper bag. To calm me down, they said, it's just the flora and fauna, flora and fauna. I had multiple swabs inserted into my vagina and anus. Needles for shots, pills, had a Nikon pointed right into my spread legs. I had long pointed beaks inside me, and I had my vagina smeared with cold blue paint to check for abrasions. After a few hours of this, they let me shower. I stood there examining my body beneath the steam of water and decided, I do not want this body anymore. I am terrified. I do not what I do not know what had been in it. If it had been contaminated, who touched it? 
I wanted to take off my body like a jacket and leave it at the hospital with everything else. On that morning, I was told, all that I was told was that I had been found beside a dumpster, potentially penetrated by a stranger, and that I would get, I should get retested for HIV because results don't always show up immediately. But for now, I should go home and get back to my normal life. Imagine stepping back into the world with only that information. They gave me huge hugs and I walked out of the hospital into the parking lot wearing the new sweatshirt and sweatpants they provided me as they had only allowed me to keep my necklace and shoes. My sister picked me up, face wet from tears and contorted in anguish. Instinctively and immediately I wanted to take away her pain. I smiled at her. I told her, look at me, I'm right here. I'm okay. Everything's all right. I'm right here. My hair is washed and clean. They gave me the strangest shampoo. Calm down and look at me. Look at these funny new sweatpants and sweatshirt. I look like a PE teacher. Let's go home. Let's eat something. She did not know that beneath my sweatshirt I had scratches and bandages on my skin. My vagina was sore and had become strange, dark color from all the prodding. My underwear was missing and I felt too empty to speak. That I was also afraid. That I was also devastated. That day we drove home and for hours in silence my sister held me. My boyfriend did not know what happened but called that day and said, I was really worried about you last night. You scared me. Did you make it home okay? I was horrified. That's when I learned I had called him that night in my blackout, left an incomprehensible voicemail that we had also spoken on the phone, but I was slurring so heavily he was scared for me that he repeatedly told me to go find my sister. Again, he asked me, what happened last night? Did you make it home okay? I said yes and hung up to cry. I was not ready to tell my boyfriend or parents that actually I may have been raped behind a dumpster, but I don't know by who or when or how. If I told them, I would see the fear on their faces and mine would multiply by tenfold. So instead, I pretended the whole thing wasn't real. I tried to push it out of my mind, but it was so heavy I didn't talk. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I didn't interact with anyone. After work, I would drive to a secluded place to scream. I didn't talk. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I didn't interact with anyone. And I became isolated from the ones I loved most. For over, for over a week after the incident, I didn't get any calls or updates about that night or what happened to me. The only symbol that proved that it hadn't just been a bad dream was a sweatshirt from the hospital in my drawer. One day, I was at work scrolling through the news on my phone and came across an article. In it, I read and learned for the first time about how I was found unconscious with my hair disheveled, long necklace wrapped around my neck bra pulled out of my dress, dress pulled off over my shoulders and pulled up above my waist, that I was butt naked all the way down to my boots, legs spread apart, and have been penetrated by a foreign object by someone I did not recognize. This was how I learned what happened to me, sitting at my desk, reading the news at work. I learned what happened to me the same time everyone else in the world learned what happened to me. That's when the pine needles in my hair made sense. They didn't fall from the tree. They, he had taken off my underwear. His fingers had been inside of me. I didn't even know this person. I still don't know this person. When I read about me like this, I say, this cannot be me. This cannot be me. I could not digest or accept any of this information. I couldn't imagine my family having to read about this online. I kept reading. In the next paragraph, in the next paragraph, I read something that I will never forgive. I read that according to him, I liked it. I liked it. And again, 
I do not have words for these feelings. It's like if you were to read an article where a car was hit and found dented in a ditch, but maybe the car enjoyed being hit. Maybe the other car didn't mean to hit it. Just bump it up just a little bit. Cars get in accidents all the time. People aren't always paying attention. Can we really say who's at fault? And then at the bottom of the article, after I learned about the graphic details of my own sexual assault, the article listed his swimming times. She was found breathing, unresponsive, with her underwear six inches away from her bare stomach, curled in fetal position. By the way, he's really good at swimming. Throw in my mile time if that's what we're doing. I'm good at cooking. Put that in there. I think the end is where you list your extracurriculars to cancel out all the sickening things that have happened. The night the news came out, I sat my parents down and told them that I had been assaulted. To not look at the news because it's upsetting. Just know that I'm okay, I'm right here, and I'm okay. <clears throat> but halfway through telling them, my mom had to hold me because I could no longer stand up. The night after it happened, he said he didn't know my name said he wouldn't be able to identify my face in a lineup, didn't mention any dialogue between us, no words, only dancing and kissing. Dancing is a cute term. Was it snapping fingers and twirling dancing or just bodies grinding up against each other in a crowded room? I wonder if kissing was just faces sloppily pressed up against each other. When the detective asked if he had planned on taking me back to his dorm, he said no. When the detective asked how we ended up behind the dumpster, he said he didn't know. He admitted to kissing other girls at the party, one of whom was my own sister who pushed him away. He admitted to wanting to hook up with someone. I was the wounded antelope of the herd, completely alone and vulnerable, physically unable to fend for myself, and he chose me. Sometimes I think if I hadn't gone, then this never would have happened, but then I realized it would have happened just as somebody else. You are about to enter four years of access to drunk girls and parties and if this is the foot you started off on then it is right you did not continue. The night after it happened he said he thought I liked it because I rubbed his back. A back rub. Never mentioned me voice and consent. Never mentioned us even speaking. A back rub. One more time, in public news, I learned that my ass and vagina were completely exposed outside. My breasts had been groped. Fingers had been jabbed inside me along with pine needles and debris. My bare skin and head had been rubbing against the ground behind a dumpster, while an erect freshman was humping my half-naked, unconscious body. But I didn't remember. So how do I prove I didn't like it? I thought, there's no way this is going to trial. There were witnesses. There was dirt in my body. He ran but was caught. He's going to settle. Formally apologize, and we'll both move on. Instead, I was told he hired a powerful attorney, expert witnesses, private investigators who are going to try and find details about my personal life to use against me find loopholes in my story to invalidate me and my sister in order to show that this sexual assault was in fact a misunderstanding, that he was going to go to any length to convince the world he had simply been confused. I was not the only one. I was, I was not only told I was assaulted, I was told that because I couldn't remember I technically could not prove it was unwanted and that distorted me, damaged me, almost broke me. It was the saddest type of confusion to be told I was assaulted and nearly raped blatantly out in the open, but we don't know if it counts as an assault yet. I had to fight for an entire year to make it clear that there was something wrong with this situation. When I was told to be prepared in case we didn't win, I said, I can't prepare for that. He was guilty the minute I woke up. No one can talk me out of the hurt he's caused me. Worst of all, I was warned. 
because he now knows you don't remember. He is going to get it. He is going to get to write the script. He can say whatever he wants, and no one can contest it. I had no power. I had no voice. I was defenseless. My memory loss would be used against me. My testimony was weak, was incomplete, and I was made to believe that perhaps I am not enough to win this. His attorney constantly reminded the jury, the only one we can believe is Brock, because she doesn't remember. That helplessness was traumatizing. Instead of taking time to heal, I was taking time to recall the night in excruciating detail in order to prepare for the attorney's questions that would be invasive, aggressive, designed to steer me off course, to contradict myself, my sister, phrased in ways to manipulate my answers. Instead of his attorney saying, did you notice any abrasions? He said, you didn't notice any abrasions, right? This was a game of strategy, as if I could be tricked out of my own worth. The sexual assault had been so clear, but instead, here I was, at the trial, answering questions like, How old are you? How much do you weigh? What did you eat that day? Well, what did you have for dinner? Who made dinner? Did you drink with dinner? No, not even water. When did you drink? How much did you drink? What container did you drink out of? Who gave you the drink? How much do you usually drink? Who dropped you off at the party? At what time? But where exactly? What were you wearing? Why were you going to this party? What did you do when you got there? Are you sure you did that? But what time did you do that? What does this text mean? Who are you texting? When did you urinate? Where did you urinate? With whom did you urinate outside? Was your phone on silent when your sister called? Do you remember silencing it? Really? Because on page 53, I'd like to point out that you said it was set to ring. Did you drink in college? You said you were a party animal? How many times did you black out? Did you party at Fraz? Are you serious with your boyfriend? Are you sexually active with him? When did you start dating? Would you ever cheat? Do you have a history of cheating? What do you mean when you said you wanted to reward him? Do you remember what time you woke up? Were you wearing your cardigan? What color was your cardigan? Do you remember any more from that night? No? Okay. Well, we'll let Brock fill it in. I was pummeled with narrow, pointed questions that dissected my personal life, love life, past life, family life. I named questions, accumulating trivial details to try and find an excuse for this guy who had had me half naked before even bothering to ask for my name. After a physical assault, I was assaulted with questions designed to attack me, to say, see, her facts don't line up. She's out of her mind. She's practically an alcoholic. She probably wanted to hook up. He's like an athlete, right? They were both drunk, whatever. The hospital stuff she remembers is after the fact. Why take it into account? Brock has a lot at stake, so he's having a really hard time right now. And then it came time for him to testify, and I learned what it meant to be re-victimized. I want to remind you, the night after it happened, he said he never planned to take me back to his dorm. He said he didn't know why we were behind the dumpster. He got up to leave because he wasn't feeling well when he was suddenly chased and attacked. Then he learned I could not remember. So one year later, as predicted, a new dialogue emerged. Brock had a strange new story. Almost sounded like a poorly written young adult novel with kissing and dancing and hand-holding and lovingly tumbling onto the ground. And most importantly in this new story, there was suddenly consent. One year after the incident, he remembered, oh yeah, by the way, she actually said yes to everything. So He said he asked if I wanted to dance. Apparently I said yes. He asked if I wanted to go to his dorm. I said yes. Then he asked if he could finger me, and I said yes. Most guys don't ask, can I finger you? Usually, there's a natural progression of things, unfolding consensually, not Q&A. But apparently, I granted full permission. He's in the clear. 
even his in a story I only said a total of three words yes 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 before he had me half naked on the ground future reference if you are confused about whether a girl can consent see if she can speak an entire sentence you couldn't even do that just one coherent string of words where was the confusion this is common sense human decency according to him the only reason we were on the ground was because I fell down no if a girl falls down help her get back up if she is too drunk to even walk and falls down do not mount her hump her take off her underwear and insert your hand inside her vagina if a girl falls down help her up if she is wearing a cardigan over her dress don't take it off so that you can touch her breasts maybe she is cold maybe that's why she's wearing a cardigan next in the story two Swedes on bicycles approached you and you ran when they tackled you why why didn't you say stop everything's okay go ask her she's right over there and she'll tell you I mean you had just asked for my consent right I was awake right when the policeman arrived and interviewed the evil Swede who tackled you he was crying so hard he couldn't speak because of what he had seen your attorney has repeatedly pointed out well we don't know exactly when she became unconscious and you're right maybe I was still fluttering my eyes and wasn't completely limp yet that was never the point I was too drunk to speak English too drunk to consent way before I was on the ground I should have never been touched in the first place Brock stated at no time did I see that she was not responding. If at any time I thought she was not responding, I would have stopped immediately. Here's the thing. If your plan was to stop only when I became unresponsive, then you still do not understand. You didn't even stop when I was unconscious anyway. Someone else stopped you. Two guys on bikes noticed I wasn't moving in the dark and had to tackle you. How did you not notice while on top of me? You said you would have gotten you would have stopped and gotten help. You said that, but I want you to explain how you would have helped me. Step by step, walk me through this. I want to know if those evil Swedes had not found me, how the night would have played out. I am asking you, would you have pulled my underwear back on over my boots, untangled the necklace around my neck, closed my legs, covered me? Pick the pine needles from my hair, asked if the abrasions on my neck and bottom hurt would you then go out go find a friend and say will you help me get her somewhere warm and soft I don't sleep when I think about the way it could have gone if the two guys had never come what would have happened to me that's what you'll never have a good answer for that's what you can not explain even after a year on top of all this, he claimed that I orgasmed after one minute of digital penetration. The nurse said there had been abrasions, lacerations, and dirt in my genitalia. Was that before or after I came? To sit under oath and inform all of us that yes, I wanted it, yes, I permitted it, and that you are the true victim attacked by Swedes for reasons unknown to you is appalling is demented is selfish is damaging it is enough to be suffering it is another thing to have someone ruthlessly working to diminish the gravity and of validity of this suffering my family had to see pictures of my head strapped to a gurney full of pine needles of my body in the dirt with my eyes closed hair messed up limbs bent and dress hiked up and even after that, my family had to listen to your attorney say the pictures were after the fact. We can dismiss them. To say, yes, her nurse confirmed that there was redness and abrasions inside of her, significant trauma to her genitalia. But that's what happens when you finger someone, and he's already admitted to that. To listen to your attorney attempt to paint a picture of me, the face of girls gone wild, as if somehow that would make it so that I had this coming for me, 
to listen to him say, I sounded drunk on the phone because I'm silly and that's my goofy way of speaking. To point out that in the voicemail I said I would reward my boyfriend and we all know what I was thinking. I assure you, my rewards program is not transferable, especially to any nameless man that approaches me. He has done irre irreversible damage to me and my family during the trial, and we have sat silently listening to him shape the evening. But in the end, his unsupported statements and his attorney's twisted logic fooled no one. The truth won. The truth spoke for itself. You are guilty. Twelve jurors convicted you guilty of three felony counts beyond reasonable doubt. That's twelve votes per count. Thirty-six yeses confirming guilt. That's one hundred percent unanimous guilt. And I thought, finally, it is over. Finally, he will own up to what he did, truly apologize, we'll both move on and get better. Then I read your statement. If you are hoping that one of my organs will implode from anger and I will die, I'm almost there. You are very close. This is not a story of another drunk college hookup with poor decision making. Assault is not an accident. Somehow you still don't get it. Somehow you still sound confused. I will now read portions of the defendant's statement and respond to them. You said being drunk, I just couldn't make the best decisions and neither could she. Alcohol is not an excuse. Is it a factor? But alcohol was not the one who stripped me, fingered me, had my head dragging against the ground with me almost fully naked. Having too much to drink was an amateur mistake that I admit to, but it is not criminal. Everyone in this room has had a night where they have regretted drinking too much or know someone close to them who has had a night where they have regretted drinking too much. Regretting drinking is not the same as regretting sexual assault. We were both drunk. The difference is I did not take off your pants and underwear, touch you inappropriately and run away. That's the difference. You said, if I wanted to get to know her, I should have asked for her number rather than asking her to go back to my room. I'm not mad because you didn't ask for my number. Even if you did know me, I would not want to be in this situation. My own boyfriend knows me, but if he asked to finger me behind a dumpster, I would slap him. No girl wants to be in this situation. Nobody. I don't care if you know their phone number or not. You said, I stupidly thought it was okay for me to do what everyone around me was doing, which was drinking. I was wrong. Again, you were not wrong for drinking. Everyone around you was not sexually assaulting me. You were wrong for doing what nobody else was doing, which was pushing your erect dick in your pants against my naked defensive body concealed in a dark area where party goers could no longer see or protect me, and my own sister could not find me. Sipping fireball is not your crime. Peeling off and discarding my underwear like a candy wrapper to insert your finger into my body where is where you went wrong. Why am I still explaining this? You said, during the trial, I didn't want to victimize her at all. That was just my attorney and his way of approaching the case. Your attorney is not your scapegoat. He represents you. Did your attorney say some incredulously infuri infuriating, degrading things? Absolutely. He said you had an erection because it was cold. You said you're in the process of establishing a program for high school and college students in which you speak about your experience to speak out against campus drinking culture and the sexual promiscuity that goes along with that? Campus drinking culture, that's what we're speaking out against? You think that's what I've spent the past year fighting for? Not awareness about campus sexual assault or rape or learning to recognize consent? Campus drinking culture, 
down with Jack Daniels, down with Sky Vodka. If you want to talk, if you want to talk people to talk to people about drinking, go to an AA meeting. You realize having a drinking problem is different than drinking and then forcefully trying to have sex with anyone. Show men how to respect women, not how to drink less. Drinking culture and the sexual promiscuity that goes along with that. Goes along with that like a side effect, like fries on the side of your order? Where does promiscuity even come into play? I don't see headlines that read, Brock Turner, guilty of drinking too much and the sexual promiscuity that goes along with that. Campus sexual assault. There's your first PowerPoint slide. Rest assured, if you fail to fix the topic of your talk, I will follow you to every school you go to and give a follow-up presentation. Lastly, you said, I want to show people that one night of drinking can ruin a life. A life. One life. Yours. You forgot about mine. Let me rephrase for you. I want to show people that one night of drinking can ruin two lives, you and me. You are the cause, I am the effect. You have dragged me through this hell with you, dipped me back into that night again and again. You knocked down both our towers. I collapsed at the same time you did. If you think I was spared, came out unscathed, and that today I ride off into the sunset while you suffer the greatest blow, you are mistaken. Nobody wins. We have all been devastated. We have all been trying to find some meaning in all this suffering. Your damage was concrete, stripped of titles, degrees, enrollment. My damage was internal, unseen. I carry it with me. You took away my worth, my privacy, my energy, my time, my safety, my intimacy, my confidence, my own voice until today. See, one thing we have in common is that we're both unable to get up in the morning. I am no stranger to suffering. You made me a victim. In newspapers, my name was unconscious, intoxicated woman. Ten syllables and nothing more than that. For a while, I believed that's all I was. I had to force myself to relearn my real name and my identity. To relearn that this is not all that I am. That I'm not just a drunk victim at a frat party found behind a dumpster. While you are the all-American swimmer at a top university, innocent until proven guilty, with so much at stake, I'm a human being who has been irreversibly hurt. My life was put on hold for over a year, waiting to figure out if I was worth something. My independence, natural joy, gentleness, and steady lifestyle I have been enjoying became distorted beyond recognition. I became closed off, angry, self-depreciating, tired, irritable, empty. The isolation at times is unbearable. You cannot give me back the life I had before that night either. While you worry about your shattered reputation, I refrigerated spoons every night so when I woke up and my eyes were puffy from crying, I would hold the spoons to my eyes to lessen the swelling so that I could see. I showed up an hour late to work every morning. Excuse myself to cry in the stairwells. I can tell you all the best places in that building to cry where no one can hear you. The pain became so bad that I had to explain the private details to my boss to let her know why I was leaving. I needed time because continuing day to day was not possible. I used my savings to go as far away as I could possibly be. I did not return to work full time as I knew I'd have to take weeks off in the future for the hearing and trial that were constantly being rescheduled. My life was put on hold for over a year. My structure had collapsed. I can't sleep alone at night without having a light on, like a five-year-old, because I have nightmares of being touched where I cannot wake up. I did this thing where I waited until the sun came up and I felt safe, safe enough to sleep for three months. I went to bed at 6 o'clock in the morning. I used to pride myself on my independence. Now I'm afraid to go on walks in the evening, to attend social events with drinking among friends where I should be comfortable being. I have become a little barnacle always needing to be at someone's side, 
to have my boyfriend standing next to me, sleeping beside me, protecting me. It is embarrassing how it feels, how feeble I feel, how timidly I move through life, always guarded, ready to defend myself, ready to be angry. You have no idea how hard I have worked to rebuild parts of me that are still weak. It took me eight months to even talk about what happened. I could no longer connect with friends, with everyone around me. I would scream at my boyfriend, my own family, whenever they brought this up. You never let me forget what happened to me. At the end of the hearing, the trial, I was too tired to speak. I would leave drained, silent. I would go home, turn off my phone, and for days I would not speak. You bought me a ticket to a planet where I lived by myself. Every time a new article came out, I lived with a paranoia that my entire hometown would find out and know me as the girl who got assaulted. I didn't want anyone's pity, and I am still learning to accept victim as part of my identity. You made my own hometown an uncomfortable place to be. You cannot give me back my sleepless nights. The way I have broken down sobbing uncontrollably if I'm watching a movie and a woman is harmed. To say it lightly, this experience has expanded my empathy for other victims. I have lost weight from stress. When people would comment, I told them I've been running a lot lately. There are times that I, I did not want to be touched. I have to relearn that I'm not fragile. I am capable. I am wholesome, not just livid and weak. When I see my younger sister hurting, when she's unable to keep up in school, when she is deprived of joy, when she is not sleeping, when she is crying so hard on the phone, she's barely breathing, telling me over and over again, she's sorry for leaving me alone that night. Sorry, sorry, sorry. When she feels more guilt than you, then I do not forgive you. That night, I called her to try and find her, but you found me first. Your attorney closing statement began. Her sister said she was fine, and who knows her better than her sister. You tried to use my own sister against me? Your points of attack were so weak, so low, it was almost embarrassing. You do not touch her. You should have never done this to me. Secondly, you should have never made me fight so long to tell you you should have never done this to me. But here we are, the damage is done, no one can undo it, and we both have, and now we both have a choice. We can let this destroy us, I can remain angry and hurt, and you can be in denial, or we can face it head on, I accept the pain, you accept the punishment, and we move on. Your life is not over. You have decades of years ahead to rewrite your story. The world is huge. It is so much bigger than Palo Alto and Stanford. And you will make a space for yourself in it where you can be useful and happy. But right now, you do not get to shrug your shoulders and be confused anymore. You do not get to pretend that there were no red flags. You have been convicted of violating me intentionally, forcibly, sexually, with malicious intent. And all you can admit to is consuming alcohol. Do not talk about the sad way your life was upturned because alcohol made you do bad things. Write out, figure out how to take responsibility for your own conduct. Now to address the sentencing. When I read the probation officer's report, I was in disbelief, consumed by anger, which eventually quieted down to profound sadness. My statements have been slimmed down to distortion and taken out of context. I fought hard during this trial and will not have the outcome minimized by a probation officer who attempted to evaluate my current state and my wishes in a 15-minute conversation, the majority of which was spent answering questions I had about the legal system. The context is also important. Brock had yet to issue a statement. And I had not read his remarks. My life has been on hold for over a year. A year of anger, anguish, and uncertainty. Until a jury of my peers rendered a judgment that validated the injustices I had endured. 
Had Brock admitted guilt and remorse and offered to settle early on, I would have considered a lighter sentence. Respecting his honesty, grateful to be able to move our lives forward. Instead, he took the risk of going to trial, added insult to injury, and forced me to relive the hurt as details about my personal life and sexual assault were brutally dissected before the public. He pushed me and my family through a year of inexplicable, unnecessary suffering and should face the consequences of challenging his crime, of putting my pain into question and making us wait so long for justice. I told the probation officer I do not want Brock to rot away in prison. I did not say he does not deserve to be behind bars. The probation officer's recommendation of a year or less in county jail is a soft timeout, a mockery of the seriousness of his assaults, an insult to me and all women. It gives the message that a stranger can be inside you without proper consent and he will receive less than what has been defined as the minimum sentence. Probation should be denied. I also told the probation officer that what I truly wanted was for Brock to get it, to understand and to admit his wrongdoing. Unfortunately, after reading the defendant's report, I am severely disappointed that he has failed to exhibit sincere remorse or responsibility for his conduct. I fully respected his right to a trial. But even after 12 jurors unanimously convicted him guilty of three felonies, all he has admitted to doing is ingesting alcohol. Someone who cannot take full accountability for his actions does not deserve a mitigating sentence. It is deeply offensive that he would try and dilute rape with a suggestion of promiscuity. By definition, rape is the absence of promiscuity. Rape is the absence of consent. And it perturbs me deeply that he can't even see that distinction. The probation officer factored in that the defendant is youthful and has no prior conviction. In my opinion, he's old enough to know what he did was wrong. When you are 18 in this country, you can go to war. When you are 19, you are old enough to pay the consequences for attempting to rape someone. He is young, but he's old enough to know better. As this is a first offense, I can see where leniency would beckon. On the other hand, as a society, we cannot forgive everyone's first sexual assault or digital rape. It doesn't make sense. The seriousness of rape has to be communicated clearly. We should not create a culture that suggests we learn that rape is wrong through trial and error. The consequences of sexual assault needs to be severe enough that people feel enough fear to exercise good judgment even when they're drunk, severe enough to be preventative. The probation officer weighed the fact that he has surrendered a hard-earned swimming scholarship how fast Brock swims does not lessen the severity of what happened to me and should not lessen the severity of his punishment. If a first-time offender from an underprivileged background was accused of three felonies and displayed no accountability for his actions other than drinking, what would have been what what would his sentence be? The fact that Brock was an athlete at a private university should not be seen as an entitlement to leniency but as an opportunity to send a message that sexual assault is against the law, regardless of social class. The provision officer has stated that this case, when compared to other crimes of similar nature, may be considered less serious due to the defendant's level of intoxication. It felt serious. That's all I'm going to say. What has he done to demonstrate that he deserves a break? He has only apologized for drinking and has yet to define what he did to me as sexual assault. He has re-victimized me continually, relentlessly. He has been found guilty of three serious felonies and it is time for him to accept the consequences of his actions. He will not be quietly excused. He is a lifetime sex registrant that doesn't expire just like what he did to me doesn't expire, doesn't just go away after a set of number of years. It stays with me. It's a part of my identity. It has changed me 
changed, it has forever changed the way I carry myself, the way I live the rest of my life. To conclude, I want to say thank you to everyone from the intern who made me oatmeal when I woke up in the hospital that morning, to the deputy who waited beside me, to the nurses who calmed me, to the detective who listened to me and never judged me, to my advocates who stood unwaveringly beside me, to my therapist who taught me to find courage in vulnerability, to my boss for being kind and understanding, to my incredible parents who teach me how to turn pain into strength. To my grandma who snuck chocolate into the courtroom throughout this to give to me. My friends who remind me how to be happy. To my boyfriend who is patient and loving. To my unconquerable sister who is the other half of my heart. To Alala, my idol who fought tirelessly and never doubted me. Thank you to everyone involved in the trial for their time and attention. Thank you to girls across the nation that wrote cards to my DA to give to me. So many strangers who cared for me. Most importantly, <clears throat> thank you to the two men who saved me, who, I've, who I have yet to meet. I sleep with two bicycles that I drew taped above my bed to remind myself there are heroes in this story. That we are looking out for one another. To have known all of these people, to have felt their protection and love, is something I'll never forget. And finally, to girls everywhere, I am with you. On nights when you feel alone, I am with you. When people doubt you or dismiss you, I am with you. I fought every day for you, so never stop fighting. I believe you. As the author Anne Lamott once wrote, lighthouses don't go running all over an island looking for boats to save. They just stand there shining. Although I can't save every boat, I hope that by speaking today, you absorbed a small amount of light, a small knowing that you can't be silenced, a small satisfaction that justice was served, a small assurance that we are getting somewhere, and a big, big knowing that you are important. Unquestionably, you are untouchable, you are beautiful, you are to be valued, respected, undeniably every minute of every day. You are powerful and nobody can take that away from you. To girls everywhere, I am with you. Thank you.